Our scripture reading today comes to us from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. It's a story, a parable that Jesus tells his disciples and his followers. And I'd like to present that story this way. For it is as, as if a man going on a journey summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But... The one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward bringing five more talents. And he said, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, enter the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said, well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy with a few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. Come, enter the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward, but he said, master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and and, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. I, I, I was afraid, so, so I, I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. The master said, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you should have invested my money with the bankers. Then on my return, I would have received what belongs to me with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. Four. For to all those who have, more will be given and, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless servant, send him to the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. So we have a landowner, has a big estate, multiple properties perhaps, and he's preparing to embark on a long journey that will take him away from home for many months, maybe even a few years. Before he goes, he calls three of his, let's call them managers, servants, managers might be a better, more appropriate term for our current situation. And he takes some of his assets and he entrusts it to those managers. And he gives them something called talent. T-A-L-E-N-T, -E like the word we know, talent. Five talents, two talents, one talent. Now, a talent was a way of measuring wealth or money. It wasn't necessarily a currency, like a coin or a dollar or a Deutsche Mark, but it was a way of organizing wealth. One talent was worth 15 years' wages. So just on a quick math scale here in today's terms, if we figure on a 30,000 a year salary, say, this would mean that five talents is over two million dollars, two talents is just under a million, and 
one talent is just under a half a million dollars today. That's either way we look at it, that's a lot of money. But I would suggest that this parable is not primarily about money. Even though there's lots of references to financial type things like investing with the bankers and doubling profits and trading and interest. <laughs> really, Jesus' main purpose in using talents is to communicate the great generosity and trust of the landowner who places all of this, these great resources, into the hands of those that are closest to him. And notice that he doesn't give to them all equally. Right? Five, two, and one. There's nothing equal about that. But that's okay because he gives to them fairly. He's not equal, but he's fair. And that's okay. There was a line early in the story that said, he gave to them each according to their ability. That's fair. I do it in my household all the time. I have a 16-year-old and an 8-year-old. And when it comes to the distribution and reception and consumption of food, we don't expect the 16-year-old and the 8-year-old to consume equal amounts of food. Right? We expect them to receive food fairly, which is relative to their ability at a 16-year-old age and an 8-year-old age to receive and consume food, which is relative to their age and stage in life. So they're not treated equally, but they are treated fairly, and that's also okay because the point is not on how much each one of those managers received, but rather what they did with what they received. Because when the, the, the landowner comes back from his long journey, the first thing he wants to know is, what did you do with what I gave you? He wants to settle accounts with them. The first two the one who received five and two, they doubled the amount. And the landowner is exceedingly happy. Well done! Come, enter the joy of your master. Be rewarded. He's over the top in his gratitude. The third one says that he was afraid because the landowner was harsh. So he hides it, he doesn't do anything with it, he buries it in the ground, and so he returns the one talent that he was given. And this infuriates the landowner, who is so irate that he kicks him off the ranch and takes everything from him. Kind of proves the point of the third manager. We can see why the third manager called him a harsh man. But that landowner is an odd sort is an interesting figure in the story. The landowner, when he hears that the first two managers doubled their income, noticed that he didn't ask any questions about how. Maybe they did it by dishonest means. Ponzi scheme, fraud, embezzlement, racketeering, extortion. None of that seems to matter to the landowner. And similarly, with the third manager, this... Uh, figure over here accuses the landowner of some pretty rough stuff. Theft. You reap where you do not sow. You gather where you do not scatter seed. You take what doesn't belong to you. And he does not deny it. <laughs> he doesn't say that's not true. He says, you know, do you, that I do this? What's also confusing about this landowner is that there's only one other place in Scripture where the word talent is mentioned like this. And in the New Testament, where talent is mentioned. And it's in another story from Jesus in Matthew 18. And in that story, we have another landowner who has a servant who comes to him. And, and the servant owes 10,000 talents. Not five, two, or one, but 10,000. In other words, 150,000 years worth of salary. In other words, an impossible debt to pay off. Cannot do it. But when this servant begs for mercy, the landowner in that story, eh, sure, forgives the whole debt. Eh, 
pretend like it never happened. Oftentimes in the parables of Jesus, we think of the landowner as the God figure. I've said it myself here from the pulpit. That's confusing, though, in these two stories, because why would God in one story not mind losing 10,000 talents and turn around in the next story and become irate about losing just the interest on one single talent? That kind of behavior seems inconsistent at best. The easy answer is that the stories are serving different purposes in the overall scheme of the gospel. But in the story, what is consistent with the landowner among these three managers is that the landowner wants growth. The landowner wants growth from this one, from this one, and from this one. From all of them wants growth. The first two are rewarded because their first thought was about growing. How can we take what's been placed in our hands and allow it to grow so that it produces more? Notice that the first, uh, the first manager says he went off at once, at once, without delaying he went off to see what he could do to let this, what he'd been given, grow. The third manager not only was his first thought not on growth, it was on the opposite. It was on protecting, preserving, not losing, keeping exactly what he'd received in exactly the same shape as it came to him. That's why he was condemned. And that, to me, is the most important part of the story. Because Jesus is telling this story in chapter 25. Matthew only has 28 chapters in it. And beginning in 20, chapter 26, verse 1, it's the beginning of the end for Jesus. The Last Supper, the upper room, the arrest in the garden, the crucifixion, the death, the burial. Jesus knows that his time is limited. He knows that he's in his final hours. And he knows that this is his last opportunity to speak with his followers and his disciples. And he's trying to cram everything he can into this final lecture, this final seminar. That's why to me there's a sense of urgency. He's trying to find the right words to connect with them. So that the word gets across. He knows he's leaving. And he needs to know that the kingdom that he's building will continue to grow when he's gone. He needs to know that he can trust his disciples with this ministry and this mission. Notice that's why the first, two, uh, the first two managers are called trustworthy. Well done, good and trustworthy servants. These are the ones that can be trusted with the ministry going forward. The worst thing about this guy over here is he did nothing. He did nothing with what he'd received. Jesus poured three years of his life into preaching and teaching and modeling and training. And to take it all and to bury it in the ground and ignore it, yeah, it's okay to be afraid. He said he was afraid. Well, maybe these two guys were afraid too. They just didn't say it. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. The problem comes when we allow that fear to paralyze us into inaction. And Jesus' message to us is when we do that, we're of no use to him. I don't believe that Jesus wants to send anybody to the outer darkness. He wants everybody over here on this side. But the message is if all we're going to do is take what's been placed in our hands and bury it in the ground, then we might as well be somewhere far away in a cold, dark place because we aren't any good to Jesus. See, the story to me is not about money, but it is about investing. It's about investing in what God places in us, in our hands, in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies. And the way that we invest in something is by identifying it, looking at it, naming it, claiming it, owning it, and then working with it, cultivating it, so that it ultimately produces fruit 
for others through us. A couple of weeks ago, Tina preached a great sermon on the parable of the sower. The sower, the farmer who sows seeds in all kinds of ground. And only the good soil in that parable produced fruit. And isn't it interesting, in the first parable that Jesus told, and now all the way to the last one, they're about producing fruit, about growing the gifts inside of us for the betterment of the kingdom. A couple, not a couple of weeks ago, last week, seven days ago, uh, eight days ago, we had a great storytelling event downstairs in our, in our great hall. And the theme of that storytelling night, we had seven church members stand up at the microphone and tell first-person narratives from their life, from their life's journey. And the theme for the evening was, I was made for this, stories of our true nature. As I sat there listening to these stories, it struck me how many of them followed a, a similar pattern. For example, one of our storytellers told a story from her childhood about how when she was a little girl, she discovered that she had the gift for speaking out in the name of justice. And the situation involved her speaking out against her father as a little girl, <laughs> against one of the rules of the household that she thought was unjust. And how years later that gift manifested itself as she stood before the Illinois State Legislature man, um, speaking out on the name, in the name of justice for uh, m the mentally ill. And then another one of our storytellers told a story about how he, when he was a little boy, he discovered that he had a gift for drumming on things. He was always antsy with a lot of nervous energy, even pounding on the pews here in the, in, at Central Christian, much to his mother's chagrin. And, and how years later, that same person is using that gift downstairs at our contemporary service as a drummer in our praise band. But in both of those stories, we see the same elements of our parable today. Yeah, there's fear involved. There's the fear of failure, the fear of ridicule, the fear of, of losing, the fear of, of the unknown. But that fear can be overcome. Right? There's, the, there's the theme of practicing and cultivating. Those gifts have to be used, nurtured along the way. The best thing about those two stories was, unlike the third manager, these two storytellers, they didn't bury the gift that God had given them. They always remembered it. It lay in there, inside them. And they allowed that to grow and ultimately produce fruit for others through them. This week is Thanksgiving, as you well know. Thanksgiving is a, is a good time, as Doug said. It, it's not the only time to be thankful, thank you. <laughs> but it is a good reminder to, to give thanks. And so I invite you sometime this week to think about this question. What were you made for? What has God placed in your hands? What is your true nature? One way to think about that is asking yourself the question, what gives me great joy when I'm doing it? Or perhaps better put, what gives others great joy when I am doing it? <laughs> but chances are that's something that God has gifted you with. And give thanks for that gift this week, but also remember our story today and that the best way to give thanks is to invest in that gift and cultivate that gift so that it produces fruit for others and for the kingdom through us. Thanks be to God.